Her name was Michelle. She was 24 years old. She was trapped in a demeaning world of prostitution, drug addiction, and alcoholism. Wanting to escape the hell on earth that had become her life. Michelle disguised herself and hid from her pimp while she went through chemical withdrawal. But she was discovered. And she was beaten until she was unconscious. While the other prostitutes watched and learned. Next, she tried to commit suicide. Anything to escape the nightmare that her life had become. A relative found her body and rushed her to the hospital where her life was saved. This time, Michelle turned to the only place she could imagine where she might find hope, the church. You see, she had no sense of self-worth left. She had been used by men, rejected by the world. But she turned to God's people. Knowing that she deserved punishment, but hoping against hope that she would find mercy. But you see, halfway through the church service, the pastor recognized her. It's a whole other story how he recognized her, but we won't get into that. And before the entire congregation, he pointed her out and lectured her for defiling the house of God with her filthy presence. And then he ordered her to get out of the church, judged, and then to death. Last week, as we started this series, we looked at how that spirit has no place in the life of a Christ follower. And it has no place in a church like that. Jesus went out of his way to say, whatever you get from me about heaven and hell, holiness and sin, don't read into anything that license to judge and to condemn others. So when people hold up signs, signs like, we hate facts, when they shun people who are divorced, when they stand outside abortion clinics and call scared young girls murderers. When they say that New Orleans deserved Katrina, New York deserved 9-11, or California deserves it whenever the big one hits. They are not followers of Christ. Instead, the church, the church is to welcome them Welcome those who have messed up. Those who have screwed up marriages, piercings, tattoos, addictions, divorce, children out of wedlock, roommates who aren't their spouses. We are to welcome everyone. Everyone's differences and everyone's scandals with an even greater scandal, the scandal of grace. not always in affirmation of their life choices, but always with personal acceptance so that they can experience that grace for themselves. But what about God himself? Is that where the condemnation begins with him? Unfortunately, that's what some people think. You see, some people view God as the auditor from the IRS, the highway patrol officer sitting in a speed trap, the angry parent it's best to avoid. But one of the things that Jesus did over and over again 
was to try and give people an accurate picture of who God really is. After all, Jesus is God himself in human form who came to this earth to show us who God really is. And Jesus would do that oftentimes by telling stories. So let's look at one of those stories today. One that we'll see that we don't have a judgmental thought. That we don't have a God who condemns, but we have a God very, very different than that. It's a story that many of you might know, but let's read it together. A young man, a man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of the estate now. Instead of waiting until you die, so the father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all of his belongings and took a trip to a distant land. And there he wasted all of his money on wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land. And he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him to feed his pigs. The boy became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. But no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, At home, even the hired men have food enough to spare. And here I am, dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. And I am no longer worthy of be calling, being called your son. Please take me on as a hired man. Let's stop there for a second. When it came to the son, Jesus didn't pull any punches. The son was selfish, insensitive to his father, Greedy for all he could get, and then anxious to walk away and live his life on his own. In fact, that's putting it mildly. When he asked for his inher inheritance before the father had even died, it was like saying to his father, I wish you were dead. I want nothing to do with you. From this po point forward, you are dead to me. And then he threw himself into a lifestyle that he knew abandoned every value that his father took. He chased a life that would embarrass his father, would bring shame onto his family, and fleshed out rebellion against the life his father had called him to live. And even that, even that is not strong enough. You see, the word that's used for wild living from that verse. That Greek word is used only one time in the entire Bible. Here. The only time that word is ever used. And it means incurable, hopeless. Someone who's living in such a way that it is literally destroying himself. The word gives the idea of wildness, a lack of discipline, living in a way that dissipates your life until nothing is left. No other life the entire Bible described with that same word. That's the strength of what's going on in his life. But then, the money ran. Times got hard. And he realized the nature of his life. You see, he had pursued multiple sexual partners and experiences, but never gained companionship. He had spent the money, but found it never gave him any lasting satisfaction. He chased independence. 
and ended up a little more than sweat. In the end, he had nowhere to go but home. And yet, that was the last place that he wanted to go. He knew what he would find there, or at least what he deserved to find there. Condemnation. Judgment. Maybe even worse. And that reminds me of another ancient story which is very similar to this. The story of another wayward son. A boy who was involved with the wrong crowd and they persuaded him to join them in the robbery of this boy's father. And after the robbery was over, his friends fled to the loot, leaving this boy alone to face the guilt. Deserted by his friends, realizing that he had betrayed his father, he went home and he begged his father for forgiveness. Surprisingly, it was granted. And then the father called everyone together for a feast to celebrate the reconciliation and return of his son. And the father stood up and lifted his cup for a toast. And the son drank the contents of his cup. And he grabbed his throat, fell lifeless across the table. The father had poisoned his mouth. He got what he deserved. The son in Jesus' story might have expected the same, but he had nowhere to go. He hoped against hope that what he longed for more than anything to be back in a relationship with his father it might be possible. Maybe. Just me. Then, just, then Jesus brings the Father into the story. And he reveals the Father's heart. Though we've already been given a clue about it. When the Son asked for his inheritance, the Father didn't have to give it. He didn't have to let him go. Because it meant dividing up his property and selling it. He could have looked at his son and said, if that's the way you feel, get out. I'm not giving you a dime. But he let him go. He gave him his inheritance. And he let him go. So what happened when the boy returned? Let's pick up the story there. So he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long distance away, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf that we have been fattening in the pen. We must celebrate with a feast. For the son of mine was dead and is now returned to us. He was lost, but now he is found. For the party began. Now that's done. But make sure you get the picture here. While the son was still a long distance away, his father saw him coming. You know what that means? <clears throat> that he was looking for him. Still looking for him. After all that time. Gazing out of him. Every morning. Every night, week after week, month after month, staring out at the road, hoping for his son's return. When he finally saw him, 
How did we do that? Anger? No. Fury, wrath, judgment, condemnation, all of those were justified. But none of those were responded. The Father's heart was filled with love and compassion. His heart broke at the life his son had chosen to live and what it had done to him. And he was overjoyed that he had returned home. And then he did the unthinkable. He started to run. Don't overlook that fact. In that day's culture, no father, none, would run out to his son. Much less a wayward prodigal son. It didn't happen. The son would have approached his father. Would have shown appropriate signs of respect. And then would wait for a response. From his father. So not the father in Jesus, Jesus' story. He breaks out in a full run. He couldn't control himself. He threw all dignity, all decorum, all reservation to the wind. And he ran. Can't you just see this old man? Tears streaming down his face, running down the road with his clothes flapping in the wind, his arms outstretched, his beard flapping, grinning and laughing and crying all at the same time. All over the sight of his child. And the son hadn't even apologized yet. He didn't know what his son was coming for. The son could have been coming and asking for more money. It didn't matter. The father was looking for him and ran. And then he picked him up, held him tight, never wanting to let him go. And he didn't even let the son give the entire speech. He was too busy calling out to everyone else, he's home, he's home. Break out the band, prepare the table. He's home. Dead, now alive, lost, and now found. In that very moment, the son realized that everything he had thought about his father was wrong. Everything he believed about his father's character was unfair. Everything he had been searching for was found right there. Jesus told that story to tell us that that father is God and that we are that child, the prodigal child. Because God is a God of grace. George Butcher, who was the former chaplain at Harvard, used to talk about when students would come into his office and they would say, I don't believe in God. And he'd tell them to sit down and tell me what kind of God you don't believe in. Because I probably don't believe in that type of God either. So if you've been thinking of you know, God is that cosmic cop, that IRS auditor, the angry parent, the condemner, think again. Because that's not who God is. <laughs> Whenever I think of this story, I think of another story that I read of a young girl who grew up on a cherry orchard just above Traverse City, Michigan. You see, her parents, they were a bit old-fashioned. They tended to overreact to her nose rings, 
her music, her short skirts. They grounded her a few times. They argued regularly. And then one night, after a heated argument, she screamed out at her father, I hate you. And later that night, she ran away. And she went to Detroit. She thought that that would be the last place that they would ever look for her. On the second day in the city, she met a man who drove the, one of the biggest cars that she had ever seen. He offered her a ride, bought her lunch, and arranged for her to have a place to stay. He even gave her some pills, some pills to make her feel better than she'd ever felt before. And she thought to herself, she had been right all along. Her parents had been keeping her from having fun. The good life, as she called it, went on for a month, two months, a year. The man in the big car taught her a few things that men like. And since she was underage, men paid a premium. She lived in a penthouse, ordered a room service whenever she wanted. Every now and then, she thought back to her parents, back home. But their lives, they seemed so boring and plain and old fashioned. She could hardly believe she ever grew up there. She once had a brief scare when she saw her picture printed on the back of the milk carton with the word having seen this child. But she figured she now had blonde hair when with all the makeup and body piercings, nobody would recognize her. You see, after a year, after a year, the first signs of illness began to appear. And it amazed her how fast her boss turned into a mean person. He said, he said he couldn't risk having anyone around who was sick. So he threw her out on the street without a penny to her name. He was able to turn a couple of tricks a day, but that didn't pay much. And all that money went to her drug habit. When winter came, she would sleep on the metal grates outside of the department store. Although sleeping was probably not the right word, a teenage girl in downtown Detroit could never really relax, let her guard down. She had dark bands around her eyes. Her cough worsened. Everything about her life suddenly looked different. She felt like a little girl lost in a cold and frightening city. She started to cry. Her pockets were empty and she was hungry. Quite frankly, she needed a fix. And suddenly a memory came into her mind of May and springtime in her own town with a million cherry trees in bloom, in her golden retriever chasing a tennis ball. She said to herself, why did I leave? My dog back home eats better than I do now. She cried again. She wanted to go home. She tried to call her parents. Three straight calls, three straight, straight times of voicemail. On the third one, she finally left a message. She said, Dad, Mom, it's me. 
I was wondering about maybe coming home. I'm catching a bus up that way. And I'll get there about midnight tomorrow. If you're not there, well, I understand. I guess I'll just stay on the bus until it gets to Canada. Do you see that bus ride from Detroit to just above Traverse City? It was about seven hours with all the stops in between. And all she could think about during that bus trip were the flaws in her plan. What if they were out of town? What if they didn't get the message? What if they were home but she didn't give them enough time to get to the bus station? What if they didn't want the best? But she began to rehearse to herself what she was going to say. And she said, Dad, I'm sorry. I know I was wrong. It's not your fault. It's all mine. Dad, can you forgive me? She said the words in her mind over and over again during that bus trip. And when the bus finally rolled into the station, the driver said, Traverse City, Michigan, 15 minutes stop. 15 minutes for her entire life to be decided. She checked herself in her comp compact mirror she noticed the tobacco stains on her fingers. She wondered whether her parents would see that, or if they would even be there. She got off the bus, and she walked towards the terminal, not knowing what to expect when she got there. But not one of a thousand scenes that had ever entered her mind matched what she saw inside that bus terminal. You see, inside that bus terminal stood a group of 40 brothers and sisters, great aunts and uncles and cousins, a grandmother, even a great grandmother. They were all wearing goofy party hats, blowing noisemakers, and taped across the entire wall of the terminal was a banner that said, Welcome home. And out of the crowd stepped her father. She said, Dad, I'm sorry, I know. And he stopped her. He said, hush, child. We've got no time for that. You'll be late for the party. A banquet waiting for you at home. That's the story Jesus told of the prodigal son. A story of someone who turned away from God and found out that it wasn't the life that they wanted. And then came back filled with guilt and shame, expecting rejection and condemnation, but instead finding love, forgiveness, and radical acceptance. Or simply put, finding grace. You know what grace is, don't you? It's getting what you don't deserve and not getting what you do. It's about God's love coming to us free of charge. No strings attached. You can't earn it. You can't work for it. It's just there. A gift. It flows from the unconditional love of God. For you, and for me. No catches, no loopholes, just the extended arms of a loving, forgiving, and gracious God to any guilt-ridden, repentant child who wants to come home. <coughs> the story of the prodigal son, the story of the prodigal daughter can be your story. You see, once you discover that God really is a God of grace, a God who looks down on us in our frailty, in our brokenness, in our sin, and longs to redeem us. You know what that word redeem means? 
To redeem someone means to buy them back. To pay whatever it costs. To do whatever it takes. To deliver someone from whatever it is that has tied them down. Whatever it has that has them in bondage. In chain. For us, that's called sin. You see, sin deserves to be judged and condemned and the penalty paid for. But the Bible, the Bible says that God came to earth in the person of Jesus to be our redeemer because he loves us. Because he loves us. He redeems us at whatever the cost. Whatever it takes, whatever it costs, no matter the price, even if that price is a cross. That's not just the God we long for. That's the God we have. Which means that whatever choices you have made that have left you broken, whatever decisions that you have made that have left you weak, Whatever acts have carried you far from the life that you know that you have been called to live. You have a God who loves you and loves and longs to redeem you. He wants to run down that road, meet you where you are, wrap his arms around you, meet your weakness with his strength. To meet your need with his plot. To meet your failure with his forgiveness. If you came here today thinking you're going to get an Easter sermon, you did. You see, what Jesus did on that cross, what Jesus did in the tomb, and what Jesus did when he rose from the tomb, that love of Jesus, the grace of Jesus, that is the very essence of the Easter season. So any time you hear a sermon where Jesus is at the center of it, where Jesus' grace is at the center of that sermon, you hear a sermon about Easter. It doesn't have to be a special sermon once a year. It happens every single week. when we have Jesus in our life. Amen. When he's there at the very center. When we accept his grace and forgiveness. That's all we need. And he's willing to run down that street to meet you right where you are. Heavenly Father. Lord, thank you for what you did. Thank you that you're willing to accept us for just who we are, no matter with all of our mistakes, with all of our flaws, with all of our sins. That you're willing to run down that street and meet us. You're not waiting for us to get to you, Lord. You're meeting us where we are. And God, help us to realize that you are, in fact, a God of grace. That you're not some cosmic cop. You're not looking for the things that we've done wrong. But you are waiting for us to turn to you. Waiting to forgive us. Waiting to redeem us. Waiting to give us that radical grace that only you can do. In your son's name.